You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Bitcoin, Ether, Ripple, Litecoin, and more. Cryptocurrencies and other digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity. Provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments on everything from coins to tokens, futures, and even OTC options. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on the Crypto Rundown. This program is brought to you by Genesis Volatility, also known as GVOL, home of institutional-grade crypto options analytics. Whether you're trading CFI options or DeFi options, cryptocurrencies move. Use GVOL Analytics to analyze implied volatility, model realized volatility, structure positions, and unlock alpha. For more information, visit gvol.io. That's G-V-O-L dot I-O. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time for the Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody. That music means it is Monday. It is 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern. It is time once again for the Crypto Rundown, the program here on the old Options Insider Radio Network where we venture beyond our traditional domain of your Apples and Teslas and VIX options and all that fun stuff and look a little bit farther afield, see what's going on out there. In the world of all things crypto derivatives, going to talk the volume, the volatility, the skew, the OI, all that good stuff, and a whole bunch more. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-evolving The Options Insider Radio Network. Pleased to see so many of you joining us on The Options Insider Plus, an Options Insider Pro tip as well. Glad you're seeing and getting a lot of value out of that. Remember, we have a great Pro Q&A coming up tomorrow. <laughs> it's going to be with the, the short vol legend himself, Mr. Don Schlesinger. So if you're intrigued by all that, make sure you join us on the pro side so you can get access to it. And then you can start sending in your questions now. We usually get oversubscribed on those sessions. So get those questions in early so you can participate as well. And of course, as always, all this data coming at you today, courtesy from our friends over there at Genesis Volatility, gvol.io. Check it out over there. The, the kick the tires, easy for me to say. Kick the tires and the light the fires over there. If you like all things crypto, volatility, and derivatives, and listening to a show like this, so I have to assume you do, then gvol.io is the place to go. As we keep on going right on into our first segment, it is time to roll out the crypto hot seat. Forget about cold storage. It's time to turn up the heat on thought leaders from the world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time to take their place on the The Crypto Crypto Hot Hot Seat. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Crypto Hot Seat, the portion of the show where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of crypto derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener, and today's guest is a newcomer to the program and indeed to the network. He is Rain Steinberg, the co-founder and CEO over there at ARCA. Rain, welcome to the Crypto Rundown program. Uh, thanks for having me. Super excited to be in the hot seat. All right. And we have had other reps from ARCA. We had Jerry David. He's the president of your ARCA Lab subsidiary on most recently back in March 
of this year. And we had your CIO, Jeff Dorman, on a couple of years ago, back on May of 2019. So it's been a little while since we've checked in with uh, ARCA proper there, Rain. And this is your first time on the network. So why don't we go ahead, as, as we do with all of our first timers, why don't you give our audience a little bit of an overview of your background in the crypto space and how you found your way to co-founding ARCA? Sure. Um, thanks, Mark. Uh, prior to co-founding ARCA, I co-founded another uh, disruptive financial service company called Wisdom Tree in the early 2000s. That's an ETF company um, that was really looking you know, to create a company around ETFs, uh, similar to the way we're creating an asset management company around digital assets here at ARCA. Um, I also spent a few years uh, at the hedge fund complex Ramius, uh, working on event-driven strategy. And uh, the way I got to digital assets was even when we were um, doing quite well uh, at Wisdom Tree, uh, we ran into the financial crisis. Um, the idea of systemic risk became very real to me. Um, and I learned about Bitcoin, um, started following it very closely. Uh, didn't think it was quite ready for institutional adoption. Uh, back in uh, you know 2011 2012, uh, but fast forward to uh, you know 2017 2018 at the foundation of Arca, uh, where we want to create an institutional asset management company um, to address digital assets, and that's what we did. Well, there's certainly a lot to address in that space. Indeed, since our last show, we've seen a lot of turbulence out there in the broad crypto market. So maybe let's start there, Rain, because a lot to analyze, a lot to debunk. We're going to get to that a little bit later, and of course our our Bitcoin breakdown segment. But you guys over there at ARCA have been analyzing a lot of different aspects of the market. Of course, over the last couple of months, we've seen this pronounced bearish trend out there in the marketplace. Most infamously, just last week, we saw right after our last show last Tuesday, we saw Bitcoin breaking through that much watched, much ballyhooed 30,000 level to the dark side before finally rebounding again this week. So a lot to unpack, but people have been putting together these bearish narratives for quite some time here, Rain, to try to explain what's been going on out here in the broad market. Seems like you folks over there at ARCA have been working diligently to perhaps bust some of these theories. So let's run down some of those, what, what your thoughts are on some of the most popular and indeed prevalent bearish theories out there for why we're seeing this pronounced sell-off in all things Bitcoin, Rain. Sure. Um, our CIO, which who I highly recommend uh, you have back, uh, Jeff Dorman, and he can go way deeper than me, but I will <laughs> fill his big shoes, um, just put out a note um, this morning uh, debunking uh, 10 uh, bear market myths on you know, theories for why this. And then I'll tell you about how I look at it at the end of that. I take a much longer view. So I, that didn't even come up on my radar uh, when Bitcoin <laughs> went through 30000 because I don't really care about the short-term prices. In my seat of looking over the broader thing, I, if the thesis and trajectory is still intact, that's all I need. And there's a lot of price volatility in this. So I let the uh, portfolio team worry about that. Um, debunking bear thesis number one. Uh, you know, there's been obviously a lot of uh, air given to the China narrative. Um, and it's obviously important what China is doing over there. Uh, but you really have to also recognize um, some of the positives to what's going on with China. You had a heavily concentrated uh, mining uh, resource in China. You still have a very command and control economy there. Um, this was always going to be um, whether the central authorities there allowed it or not. Uh, so it's actually not such a bad thing. And then when you think about the disruption for something like this, it's not like uh, the Chinese authorities are seizing Bitcoin or anything like that. They're actually just taking really offline uh, liquidity venues, if you think about it. And we have some good history for when there have been liquidity disruptions, either on a specific token or others, that while the price volatility can be quite sharp, um, that it if it's only liquidity that's gone away and not some greater impairment, which you can't really argue ab about that here, um, it actually rebounds uh, to the same point in a relatively short period of time. You had the same thing happen with, with Ripple, uh, with the SEC. You had the same thing happen uh, with uh, you know, Satoshi Vision when it, it was delisted. And you've seen a very similar pattern, a sharp decline, uh, then a pretty sharp rebound too. Yeah, you know, a lot to unpack even just that. You're right. We have talked about Ripple 
of late here. People have written into us saying, how come they can't get access to it <laughs> due to all the SEC madness? But you're right. It doesn't seem like in the near term it hit it. But then it recently, outside of the big beer trend that caught everything to the downside, didn't really seem to hurt it outside of that, even if a large portion of the audience here in the U.S. couldn't really access it. And you're, the same thing about China. That's always kind of perplexed me a little bit as well. Obviously, the broad trend coming out of China for quite some time now has been predominantly negative on a lot of these asset classes. So this this latest wrinkle, this latest twist, uh, didn't really seem to me to be that much, that shocking. And also, you're right, it was very much isolated around the mining side of the space. I think people just assume that where there's negativity for the miners, perhaps that that provides a little bit of sentiment, a little bit of insight into what the mindset is for the broad uh, Chinese economy when it comes to all things crypto. And obviously, they're a big potential marketplace for these products. We could talk China probably the rest of the show here, Ram. I know you have you have more beer theses <laughs> that you want to debunk here. So what was next on your list of the, the primary beer hypotheses that are driving us down here, Ram? Sure. Um, there's been a lot of talk about increased uh, regulatory pressure um, in the U.S., and it's just not the case. Um, you know, the SEC, CFTC, um, other regulators, banking regulators, while they're moving deliberately um, and enforcing current law, um, there's been no broader push. And I can speak to this um, pretty in depth in that we're interacting uh, with the regulators. We have a 40 Act product um, where that has received exemptive relief back in July. And that we've been engaged with the regulators this entire time. And I would say that the regulatory environment is probably more positive and accepting than it was in the early 2000s to some of the things that we were doing at Wisdom Tree on ETFs. So it's just a new technology. They're working through it. You know, they're the, the premier regulator uh, in the world really when it comes to uh, financial securities. And they're, you know, appropriately taking their time evaluating investor protection and how things like, you know, something that's decentralized, how do you take really take custody and prove ownership? These are tough questions that just aren't answered simply, but there's really been no change um, from our observation to that regulatory footing over this period. So nothing in the last, like, you know, two months that suggests anything. Interesting. So your outlook is still, it's still optimistic on the regulatory front. We've heard a lot of different things that it was the changeover from transitions. And of course, taking a while to get Gensler in the role and get everything approved. And that was gumming up the works. Of course, there still are a lot of legacy issues to sort out from the pandemic and the financial issues, let alone the meme stock craze. A lot of that is siphoning off some bandwidth from the SEC that might otherwise go towards this crypto space. But it sounds like from your interactions there, Rain, you think things are, are still positive over there. Yes, and it, the, these are just things that don't change very quickly. So as positive as they were, like, and it depends on what you view as positive. Um, like, we're not very sanguine about them approving a, a Bitcoin ETF anytime soon, and we think there are fundamental reasons that they're working on why they're not doing that. But I don't consider that necessarily a negative regulatory impact, as we didn't really put a very high probability on that. Now the market may disagree, and they may have had higher hopes on that, but. Um, we didn't see much change there. Yeah, that's a good point. When people bring up SEC, they're almost entirely viewing it through the lens of when will they approve an ETF? They saw the ETFs getting approved in Canada recently. They were they were hoping it would speed things up in the SEC here in the US. It doesn't sound like that's the case. A lot of people often conflate those two things. You're right, Rain. They, they conflate the maybe punting a bit on the ETF with, oh, that obviously the U.S. is a, a hostile regulatory environment for crypto rain, and it sounds like you don't think that's the case. Not at all. And um, also, I think that we're starting to see, when you, we say crypto, I think that maybe crypto digital assets as kind of a monolithic entity maybe was more appropriate a year ago, two years ago. Um, but you're really starting to see a lot of uh, divergence in what things are. Um, you know, DeFi projects, uh, projects that have equity-like properties, uh, security tokens. So this this incredibly you know broadening, diverse uh, ecosystem. Um, I don't think the perception of of what digital assets are have caught up with it yet. While there may be like Chinese regulatory pressure on Bitcoin specifically mining, now should that affect a DeFi project that isn't on the Bitcoin network or has nothing to do with Bitcoin? Um, you could argue both ways, but it would seem that it would have less to do with it than specifically Bitcoin. 
and a you know something that's specifically a replacement for currency um, and then some of these other DeFi projects. So I think that there's still a very you know monolithic view of this ecosystem, and you know Bitcoin is kind of the leader of it, which uh, I think is changing, and you're going to see some divergence in value uh, between things. Uh, and it won't just be all up, all down going forward. Well, selfishly, Rain, I hope that monolithic viewpoint stays intact because otherwise we have to rebrand the show. And I don't feel like doing that right now. So <laughs> let's hope everyone just keeps <laughs> keeps calling it crypto for the foreseeable future. <laughs> we can still call it crypto. All I'm saying is there's going to be pockets uh, of crypto. Uh, you're still going to have to come to the hot seat to get the, the straight dope. And you might even need to visit it more regularly for sure. There we go. I like that. I can get behind that, but you're also, I know a lot of people have been talking about, you know, the macroeconomic environment and how that feeds into crypto. People thought a lot of the run up we saw earlier in the year with regard to crypto was, of course, driven by the Fed's pumping trillions of dollars into the economy and inflation concerns. And also the flip side of that, people maybe think we're coming off the other side of that is because maybe the notion that the Fed may be easing that back, dialing that back a little bit. But you don't think that's the case either, Rain. No, I, I mean, we've been hearing about <laughs> taper seems forever. Um, you're going you're going to uh, see noise about this when it comes up. The, the truth is, I, I think, honestly, you, you, when you look at the volatility of this underlying and how early it is in its adoption, you're still talking about a very, very small asset um, in relation to other things that are considered inflation hedges and other. Uh, pieces of that, you know, fighting for that, you know, monetary uh, policy reactive like asset class. Now it's growing, but it's still very small compared to everything else. And you're going to get um, increased volatility around that, both to the upside and to the downside. And I would just encourage people to concentrate on whether, you know, the narratives are intact and the theses are attacked, intact and try not to pay attention as much to that day-to-day volatility, not for trading and doing that do, but if you're thinking about the expansion of it and its value proposition, what has fundamentally changed? And I would say not much. Um, you know, we're in the same environment, we're in the same uh, hellish monetary environment that we're before. Good luck, um, you know, tapering on all of these things and controlling inflation. I would like to see all that occur before anything happens. And it's, this is way too short a period um, to, you know, make any broad conclusions about that. And the other broad drivers for the beer trend here, kind of a combo on one hand, people thinking maybe the retail speculative frenzy, which has certainly helped drive Bitcoin and the broad crypto ecosystem to ever lofty, ever frothier heights that may be drying up. And on the flip side, the question mark people have had for ages is crypto really ready for institutions Seemed like institutions were really adopting it in mass on the march up to 65,000. Maybe that is somewhat curtailing as well. It sounds like you're not buying into either of those either, Rain. No, absolutely. Listen, this company was founded um, on institutional interest, um, and it really wasn't there when we founded it in 2018. And it was founded on the thesis that it would be here. Um, but by that time, we needed to have an institutional great company, an institutional great brand, institutional great products, track records of length for them to evaluate and think about. Um, and you can't do those things overnight. Um, we have never seen more institutional interest. And really what's different about this and some of the, the drawdowns that were where we were more dependent on um, retail investors, we're seeing people stepping in. Now, it's different than, uh, you know, the world of equities or bonds where there's, you know, well understood things of, you know, final value or value buyers and things like that. Those Those pools of capital don't really exist yet, but they're starting to come. So... We've never we've had our best um, asset flow months um, in these last couple of months. Um, our the vast majority of our LPs are seeing this as a buying opportunity, and these are all uh, the, the least the smallest of them are just high net worth individuals, and all the way out to pension funds and endowments that are looking th- at this as an incredibly bullish time uh, to get involved. So I don't buy that at all. Next up on your list here, your your top 10 beer theses out here is uh, the whole ESG movement. Obviously, Musk kind of bringing that into stark relief over the last month and change as he pivoted from loving all things Bitcoin and crypto to suddenly discovering 
which to me is still a strange pivot how he didn't know that a guy who ostensibly runs a clean energy company didn't know that Bitcoin had a bit of a high in energy footprint, but suddenly claiming that it was too high and they're not going to take the orders for Tesla out there. And of course, all of that really reverberating into concerns around the environmental footprint. We talked about on the show recently, they've broken down the major you know, crypto assets by how many kilowatt hours they actually consume in their transactions out there. So a lot of interesting analysis to be done there. In fact, just pivoting on Musk, maybe that that's an area you're missing here from your, your top 10 beer theses. It's just Musk. It seems like whatever his whims are on a daily basis here, Rain, that's kind of where the crypto market moves of late. So maybe you need to debunk him a little bit too. Um, yes, I agree. Um, and I would say that um, <laughs> what the crypto market is guilty of, I would say our broader world is probably too sensitive to outsized individual personalities that have, you know, inflated cloud or Q scores or whatever. Um, so it, did anything <laughs> radically change in Bitcoin's energy footprint between Musk love Bitcoin <laughs> six weeks later to Musk hate Bitcoin? I would say no. Um, but this is what I think is more interesting about this is really kind of our facile um, approach to ESG investing in general. Um, so this is a piece, uh, you know, a, a strategy or allocation style that is getting a bigger and bigger part of the investing dollar. And people rightly want to have their investments impact and align with positive good. This is fantastic. But we all know the financial service industry is uh, very focused on marketing and what's hot. And you've seen an explosion of ESG offerings. Now, not necessarily an explosion of, ES, of legitimate ESG or the same you know, explosion in ESG investing opportunities as well. And the SEC has actually come out with guidance about this, that anybody that's claiming um, that investments are ESG, that they really have to quantify that. And so what we were thinking that's interesting is while there's been all this uh, energy, um, hilariously, uh, focused on the energy consumption of Bitcoin and things like that, there's been almost a total ignoring of the G part of the ESG, especially when it comes to digital assets. And that is the most appropriate thing to look at. Now, the environmental concerns are interesting, but really the value proposition of blockchain and all digital assets is as a different way to do governance. And this may be one of the most fundamental shifts in governance uh, from equity and bond holders, you know, to the aligning of stakeholders, to actually having decentralized, non-human controlled companies and how you govern them. You know, this is one of the great revolutions that we've had. And almost no uh, part of the ESG, you know, concerns or narrative has been spent on that. So what we're trying to do um, at ARCA is really focus people, A, on think about what the ESG impacts are. So like the energy question is, 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 since everybody understands it, Bitcoin uses a lot of energy. Sure. But you can also think about what is Bitcoin replacing? That uses a lot of energy too. So it's not just this very easy narrative. We're encouraging people to really think about it, dig deep. And then in areas that they haven't really looked at yet, like governance, where there's a ton of stuff to do, focus there. Um, but don't just um, hang on these three letters um, and think about that, or listen to Elon Musk, because I'm sure we'll hear something different next week. Uh, you should do your own work and come up with your own ideas. It's a lot to unpack. We probably spend the rest of the show just discussing and debating the, the impact of, of Musk. And as you put these other outsized personalities, there are a lot of those floating around in crypto, but well, let's keep on rolling. Speaking of Musk, it is kind of related to him. The, another aspect of the, the bear turn the supposition are these you know, these legion, I guess you can call them conspiracy theories out there swirling around a number of different assets and, and firms out there. You know, Binance, what's the latest drama with them or Tether or Celsius? There's the legion of them out there. So you kind of lump them all together for your next beer debunking here, Rain. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the type of thing that um, is ignored in the up market, um, obsessed on or look to hang something on a down market. Uh, there are legitimate questions about all of these things. You know, Tether's still under suit with New York AG. There's still questions about, um, you know, the actual reserve status. But these are things that existed before. None of these things um, have gone higher or metastasized further. 
Um, they are the state of things. What you really have here um, in digital assets is, again, a, a very immature market where there are no like set authorities where people can look or you know places to get necessarily even good information or you know appropriate regulatory bodies that look over these things so none of the um structures for getting good information or feeling confident about things exist in the digital asset ecosystem so rumors abound um this happens on the upside when things can get frothy on the way people are feeling about these things to um overly negative it's probably somewhere in the middle um, but without, you know, places that, you know, really good, well agreed upon ways to interpret things or determine value, um, rumor and in, 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 in new window, uh, drive activity a lot more than in other asset classes. All right. We have to keep on rolling rings. We have to keep rolling with the rest of the show as well. And you have a lot of different theses here that we have to debunk. But I like this. Another one, of course, the notion that the micro strategy is going to have to come out and just unleash all of their holdings upon the market and drive Bitcoin back down to, I guess, 10,000 there, Rain. Um, no, I mean, this one, this is just completely wrong. Um, this is one where you could have Jeff or CIO who's uh, gone through the bond covenants of what's there. There, there, is, there is no way um, to force MicroStrategy <laughs> to sell its Bitcoin. Now, there is a question, and we've brought this up in the past, whether buying MicroStrategy as a way to express your Bitcoin investment view, um, the dangers of that, or how there might be better or more direct ways to do that. And you can see that here when you know something is vastly outperforming just, to, just for a lack of ways for other traditional people to invest in Bitcoin to express it. Um, and, and you see what happens. But there's nothing that has changed with uh, micro strategies footing or any indication that they could be a force seller of Bitcoin. It's going to be quite the contrary, I believe. They're going to keep buying. Speaking of contrary, another one we've heard quite a bit about, and this has been watched a lot in the market, is, of course, Grayscale, the trust, and what's going on out there with a premium slash discount uh, to NAV, and also the fact that folks who are holding the trust, they have an unlock period. And when that expires, rain, that's when it's going to come. That's when we're going to see the real flood of sellers into the Bitcoin market there, rain. Uh, again, uh, not, not accurate, really. Um, you know, the way, the way the unlock occurs is, is a rolling unlock. Um, there were some unlocks um, in uh, the, the trusts when they went from a year to six months where it condensed a whole period into, you know, six months into just one date. And that was interesting um, on the secondary market and pressure on those specific things. But also, you can't, <laughs> great for Grayscale, not necessarily Grayscale investors, but you can't sell or, or liquidate your Grayscale holdings to receive your Bitcoin. It's You buy it, institutions, and you can only sell it on the secondary market. So there could be some reflexivity on uh, Grayscale prices, but that's how, why you've seen an actual discount uh, open up there because people have realized that there are better, more direct, cost-effective ways to get Bitcoin, um, more of a deficiency in the structure overall than um, a cooling on the underlying asset class. All right, and last here, number 10 here on your list of the top 10 beer theses out there to debunk out. This one has always been a little bit perplexing to me as well, Rain, because the notion that the the fundamentals are somehow declining out there in the world of crypto, which you know, to my analysis and to my mind, there really aren't any fundamentals of Bitcoin or or most of the top crypto assets. At the end of the day, it's really what the next guy will pay for them. And right now, the next guy seems to want to pay a little less. But uh, break it down for us here. You're number 10 in your list of, of the issue that fundamentals are somehow deteriorating if they even exist out there for a lot of these crypto assets, right? Sure. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right on <laughs> Bitcoin. Um, the, it is what is the next person will pay for you. But that's also to say of any <laughs> currency out there as well. Um, so whenever uh, people will pay less, that will occur. So let's just uh, not even look at Bitcoin here. There's a broadening market of things where there are fundamentals like DEXs, lenders, stable coins. Well, all of these things have uh, dropped off their very, very highs in uh, peak dollar amount. Their volumes have actually still continued to grow. Um, we're seeing massive adoption of these things. I mean, like they, they, these are some of the fastest growing 
uh, financial tech technology companies anywhere. Um, and we really have only seen a mild deceleration, um, not even a, you know, a reduction in growth. So we consider this, and this is the space where uh, Jeff and the portfolio team play a lot, is um, projects like DeFi, uh, DEXs, um, areas where we can really try to uh, get to value as some of the greatest buying opportunities that we've seen in a tremendous amount of time with no deterioration in the underlying business. And we're seeing this as a huge buying opportunity. Well, Rain, I appreciate you joining us here on the Crypto Hot Seat to break down some of the most popular, most prevalent beer theses that are going on out there in the marketplace right now. And if folks are intrigued, they want to read your article on all this for yourselves or maybe check out what's going on, what the latest is over there at ARCA. Where should they go? What should they do, Rain? Um, they should check out our website, which is www.ar.ca. That's it. And um, you can sign up for our newsletter and hear it directly from Jeff. Um, you can check out our product set. And if you're an accredited or qualified institutional buyer, uh, click invest with us. And uh, one of our uh, sales reference will reach out to you and can walk you through all of our products. Well, Rain, like I said, I appreciate you joining us. We'll have to have you back on to debunk more of these market trends and analyze what's going on, hopefully more frequently than once every two years or so, Rain. Uh, yes. Next time, maybe you'll have me on talking about how incredibly uh, overvalued everything is. There you go. Probably there you go. Bitcoin week. at 250000 What do you say to that? See you next week, Mark. <laughs> there we go. All right. Check it out for yourselves over there at ARCA as we keep on rolling into our next segment. It is time for the Bitcoin Breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trending activity, trends, and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for the Bitcoin Breakdown. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Bitcoin Breakdown. That was a fascinating conversation about all of the drivers or the supposed drivers going on out there in the world of crypto. And a lot of that, of course, focused around the leading digital asset out there, which is indeed Bitcoin. That asset a little bit higher than it was this time on our last show, even though it took a bit of a hiatus to the dark side in between episodes. Coming into today's show, we had Bitcoin just a little bit north of the 34,000 level, almost 34,100. Puts it up about 1,600 handles from where it was this time last week. It was right around 32.5 or so on our show last week. Of course, we saw a little bit of a sojourn there to the dark side. As I mentioned, with rain, got down below the 30,000 level, hit about 29,000, almost even. That was around the nadir for the week before rebounding. We also saw it rally back up a couple of days later. That was on Tuesday where it hit that low. On Thursday, it hit about 35,000 on the upside, 35, almost 500 out there. So it had a nice little range of over 6,000 handles on the week. We're kind of towards the upper end of that again as well. Can we maintain that? We shall see. We just broke down a lot of the interesting bear thesis. I think you can wrap a lot of that up also in just, like we mentioned, Musk and the other quote-unquote outsized personalities. What are they saying about crypto this week? That seems to be where a lot of the conversation and a lot of the noise out there in the market certainly tends to aggregate around. We'll see where the vol is lining up after this kind of topsy-turvy week. On our last show, Bitcoin one-hour vol is at about a little bit north of triple digits, 105%. Had a nice run in the interim there, actually the day after our last show on Tuesday when that sell-off hit really hard. We saw Bitcoin one-hour vol spike to about 121%. That was the day, of course, it broke 30000 to the dark side. Then it has since retreated, but it's still right around that level we were at last week, a little bit shy of that, just below triple digits, at about 97% coming into showtime. Again, all these, all this vol data and everything else skew coming at you, courtesy of our friends over there at Genesis, gvol.io is the place to go. Since we had Simon on the show last week as well, let's also take a quick sojourn into BitVol, his own kind of Bitcoin VIX, the Bitcoin Fear Index. On our last show, it was about 104.5, and coming into today's show, about 102.88. So kind of an interesting little run there, of course, far away from the 2021 high we saw, which was 171, way back on the right beginning of the year, the 15th of January on this year. So that's where we saw the high. Didn't, didn't threaten it. Let's see how high we got during the height of the madness over the course of this past week, we got up to about 159, almost 160. So actually, no, that was, that was on May, was in May 23rd. 
I take that back. Actually, on June 22nd, we got up to 109. So not anywhere near that 171 level we hit back in January of this year. So BitVol kind of relaxed over the course of the last week, even though it did trend a wee bit north for a little while there. Skew, interesting evolution out there as well. Remember, of course, since our last show, we did see a lot of options come off the table there with June expiration. So that's also wreaking a little bit of havoc with those numbers this week. Uh, last show, our skew was negative five and a half, showing again pronounced downside bias. That spiked all the way down to minus 17. That was actually a couple of days after the sell-off. On June 24th is when it hit its low, which is kind of interesting coming into today's show. Still negative, but has rebounded from that negative 17 level up to about a negative 4.3. So a little bit higher than it was this time last week. Here's where we're starting to see really pronounced impacts is on the OI front because June was the number one open position kind of across the board in all the major cryptocurrencies. And that, of course, has rolled off the board since our last show. So we have the OI on Bitcoin down markedly this week. The call's only 72,000 open right now. That's down almost 30,000 contracts from this time last week. And the puts are at about 45,000. That's down nearly 20,000. So again, all of that reflecting June. June went up the board, took nearly 70,000 contracts with it out there. So a lot of paper coming off the board since last week. That means DEES now, you're looking at a monthly expirations where you folks are lining up. DEES is now the big dog with 29,000. It was up about 500 from last week. Not a big change in December. It was more just June rolling off the board. SEP number two with about 25, almost 26,000. It's up about 1,800 contracts from last week. And July has now moved into the number three spot. That's got about 24,000 contracts. So it isn't that far away from DEES. And maybe that will, given all these stark movements, people don't want to play in DEES when Bitcoin's whipping around. They want to play in something closer to the fires. I'd imagine July will start creeping up that list, maybe even be our number one by this time next week. Same deal with the open interest. The notional value of that OI out there has fallen off a cliff since our last show. Our last show, we saw about $7 billion worth of notional options value out there on Deribit. You add in all the other venues, CME and everything else gets up to about $8 billion. Uh, this show, again, June has fallen off the cliff. You can look at the chart for yourself and see it has just collapsed. That value pretty much almost cut in half, about $4 billion worth of notional value open out there on Dara. But you add in everything else, only about $4.5 billion. So a lot has come off the board since our last show. In terms of which is the number two out there right now, it's Ledger X, actually, with $172 million. So maybe they didn't have as much June roll off the board as everyone else, but it's uh, it's far ahead of CME, which has $116 million, and OKEX, which has $119 million, and even Bit.com, which has $134 million. So Ledger X fighting its way into the number two spot. Can that hold out? We shall see. A lot of you have been asking about Ledger X ever since their appearance on the show, so clearly that's resonating with a lot of you out there, and certainly for Bitcoin options traders in the U.S., you don't really have many options, pun intended, outside of CME and Ledger X, and one of those is clearly more retail size, retail friendly than the other. In terms of volume, we saw a nice spike, as you might imagine, last Tuesday during the height of the sell-off. Not even then. It wasn't back to the levels we saw back in April. We were regularly doing $2 billion worth of notional volume a day. In fact, we were pinning the needle out there most days. Nowhere near that, even this past week, only $861 million worth of notional volume going up on the tape. So not maybe what you would expect, given the height of the sell-off and the fact that we broke 30000 A lot of people getting fired up about that and the rest of the week wasn't that packed either really 602 million worth of notion on the 21st 515 million on the 23rd so those are the two days kind of bookending that dramatic sell-off on the 22nd and that those are pretty much in line with the numbers we were seeing the previous week out there so still a far cry from the heady days of april into may when we were kind of hitting two billion like clockwork across the board out there in terms of the strikes what's open out there where the action is in Bitcoin right now, the top five sizable positions. We did see, see some evolution on this as well as we saw, of course, June go the way of the dodo. The 40,000 strike is still number one, but it is down substantially, down to about 7,500 contracts. That's down about nearly 2,500 from where it was this time last week. Number two is the 20,000 strike. That one has moved up quite a bit. It was down near the bottom of our top five. Last week. Now that's number two with about almost 7,300, down about 800 contracts 
from last week. Let me go back out to the pars. <laughs> the par is still open and they're still there for number three at about 7,200 as well. That's down over 2,000, about 2,300 contracts from last week. So a lot of June pars rolling off the board this week. Number four is the 50,000 track with about 6,800 contracts. That's down nearly 3,000 as well from last week. And number five, the 60,000 strike with about 5,400 contracts open down nearly 3,000 as well. So a lot coming off the board. But part of the reason that the 20,000 strike seems like it climbed up is that it only had about 800 contracts going away in June versus the rest of these strikes having two to 3,000 contracts going away. So a lot to unpack there. But 20,000 climbing back up, which again, we broke through 30,000. So perhaps not surprising that 20,000 making it onto the list. What didn't really make it onto the list really in any material way was the options over there at CME. Another light week, despite the fact that we saw that 30,000 brush there to the dark side down to 29,000. Not a ton of volume. The busiest day, as you might imagine, was last Tuesday, but only about 42 contracts going up. So again, that contract is is very beefy, and the options volume on it, or I should say lack thereof, really reflecting that. The futures, similar story. They actually had a decent day on Tuesday with about 22,000 contracts going up. The rest of the week was about 12,000 a day or less. And the OI coming into this show is around unched from this time last week. Still about 8,000 out there, which is kind of interesting. CME did put out some interesting nuggets on their Bitcoin futures highlights year to date. Uh, they say their daily open interest has reached 9,500 contracts. Uh, so that's a little bit of a change from the OI we're looking at right now, which is about 8,000. Uh, they also say 8,380 unique active accounts have traded it since launch, about 1,600 of those added since 2021, so about a 33% increase from the same period in 2020. The number of large Bitcoin open interest holders has reached uh, 82 year to date. It's up nearly 50% from this time last year. And they mentioned the consistent trading flow they've seen throughout the 23-hour day with 47% of the volume completed by 9 a.m. Eastern when most of the U.S. is starting to kick in. And of course, uh, 36% of their trading volume originates from outside the U.S., which again is consistent with what's going on in the crypto space, where a lot of the action, a lot of the interest, a lot of the regulatory momentum is outside the U.S. right now. In spite of what Rain was saying, he thinks it's positive here, which is good. I'm glad to hear that. But we haven't seen a lot of actual tangible developments as a result. So if you want those, you still have to look elsewhere, like Canada, where they're approving ETFs, or elsewhere overseas in Asia and other areas where they're still a little bit more favorable to these products going up. Uh, Micro Bitcoin futures, similar story to what we saw on the macro, the big contracts out there. So instead, let's turn our attention now to the rest of the crypto space. Let's explore the altcoin universe. It's time to move beyond Bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace. It's time to boldly venture into the altcoin universe. All right, everybody, time to do it. Time to break down the top 10 coins, products, cryptocurrencies, digital assets out there from an overall market cap perspective. Remember, take the actual dollar by dollar market caps with a grain of salt, but the rankings, you can put a little bit more substance behind. Number 10 this week is Uniswap with about 10.1 billion worth of market cap out there. Number nine, Polkadot, 14.6 billion. Number eight, USD coin. With 26 billion, number seven, our old friend XRP down to about 29.8 billion. Number six, yes, it's Doge, Dogecoin, 33 and about a quarter billion. Number five, Cardano, 42.2 billion. Number four, Binance Coin, all the drama, all the theories swirling around all things Binance, still holding firm at number four with Binance Coin out there at least, 45 billion out there. Number three, it's Tether, more conspiracy theories around this one as well. Still holding firm at number three with about $62.5 billion. Number two, it's ETH getting back some of its luster this week to $244 billion. Number one, Bitcoin, $641 billion. I'll have to see how, how low it, dri- it dipped on the market cap when it broke 30 k out there. But again, a far cry from the one plus T level it was at not too long ago during the height of the Musk and crypto frenzy. As you mentioned, ETH having a good week net from our last show, about 150-odd handles out there. I hit a high of coming at showtime today, 2135. The low was, again, during the height of the sell-off last Tuesday. Hit 1711 out there. So interesting period out there, interesting range. A little over 400 handles out there in ETH over the course 
of the past week. Vol-wise, ETH has been more volatile for, than Bitcoin for some time. We're seeing that reflected this past week. Last show, the vol was at about 127. It spiked to 142 during the height of the sell-off on June 22nd. It's back down to about 111% right now. So still frothy, still north of the triple-digit level. The skew last show, 9.5 to the dark side. This week, negative 3.5 out there. So coming back a little bit out there. Volume-wise, the notional value of that volume, kind of the same deal as we saw with Bitcoin. Not a heck of a lot of paper on the tape. The busiest day was the 21st with a little bit shy of a quarter of a billion, 245 million worth of notional volume going up. That was the most active day by far. Every other day was pretty much a lot less out there. So not a lot of paper really on our tape over the course of the past week, despite the fact that we saw ETH trading well shy of 2000 for a while out there. OI, the same problem that's been happening in Bitcoin, also happening to a more market extent out there. And ETH, remember ETH has been concentrated on the quarterlies for quite some time. So when June rolled off the board, it took a lot of paper with it. The calls right now are down to 620,000 contracts. That's down 232,000 contracts from this time last week. And the puts are down to 368,000. That's down 228,000 contracts. So you're talking well over 450,000 contracts going the way of the dodo out there with June going off the board last week. The notional value of that OI also taking a hit. Last week, we had about $3 billion. This week, about $2 billion. So you're pretty much getting cut by about a third over the course of the past week. Looking at where you folks are lining up with the ETH from an OI perspective. Obviously, you said June off the board. That was the big dog. So now number one is Dece with about 290,000 contracts, up ever so slightly, about 3,000 from last week. Except number two with 204,000, up 5,000. And July is sliding into our top three now with 203,000. Again, if past is prologue and what we're seeing out there, a lot of whipsawing in the front portion of the curve, folks are going to want to trade more in July than they are SEP and D. So we should see July keep climbing. Whether it can get up to the lofty heights of June, probably not because June has been kind of the predominant quarterly for quite some time. So I had a lot of time to build up that OI. July only has a month before it rolls off the board. So it'd be hard for it to get up there, but if we keep whipping around, July should certainly climb up the ranks. Now, what's interesting here, listeners, we saw enormous changes in the OI since last week. And, of course, that means some of these hot strikes we've been watching for a while have changed quite a bit or perhaps fallen off our top five completely. Let's start with our top five size strikes. And I put size in air quotes because they're all much smaller than they were this time last week. And then we'll get to some of the strikes that really had the biggest fall offs, the biggest drops since last week. Uh, the number one size strike out there, the biggest position in ETH options right now, is the 5,000 strike. It's down to about 53,000 contracts. It's down nearly 20,000 from this time last week, but it's still good enough for number one. Number two, remember we had a bunch of other strikes in there between the 5,000 strike and this next strike last week, but most of those have fallen off. Number two out there, listeners, is the 480 strike. Remember, we've been saying for a while, when are these deep in the money strikes? When are they, they going to go away? Well, some of them started to go away this week. The 480 strike, not as much as the others, which is why it's number two now. It only dropped 6,400 contracts last week, so it has still about 46,000 contracts open. Number three is the 1,600 strike with about 42,800 contracts open. Number four is the 2,000 strike with 31,000 contracts. And number five is the 1,800 strike with about 29,000, almost 29,000 500 out there. So that's your top five strikes. But I said, we've had a lot of changes since last week. So what about the 3,200 strike? That was a big strike last week. That fell off nearly 40,000 contracts. Obviously, a lot of the June paper was lined up in that 3,200 strike. It was 66, almost 67,000 contracts last week. This week it has 28,600 left. So that has fallen off a cliff since last week. Same thing with those two meaty in the money strikes, the 400s and the 320s, those have had 63 and 62,000 contracts open, respectively, pretty much all year. Those both also fell off a cliff. The 400 strike lost 36,000, and the 320 strike lost 31,000. So clearly, those were June contracts, a lot of them there. Maybe a June vertical or independent contracts. Either way, they were both still open. They never bothered to close them out. So those go in the way of the dodo over the course of the past week out there. Again, if you have anything 400 or 320 strike 
or a vertical, you have effectively the ETH future. And that's kind of what went the way of the dodo over the course of the past week. So all of you who've been asking, you know, one of those 400s and 320 is going to roll off the board. We'll see something a little bit more relevant. Well, that started to happen over the course of the past week. Still some decent size out there. So obviously it wasn't all June on those strikes, but we'll we'll see. Given the fact that it's a lot of quarterlies, it's probably some step and maybe some D still on those strikes as well. So you have a little while to go for the rest of it to roll off the board, but a big chunk coming off the board this past week. Looking at some of the other contracts you guys like to watch out there really quickly. Ripple down a little over two, about two and a half cents from our last show. Bitcoin SV up actually about 20 handles almost exactly from last show. Bitcoin Cash up about 19 and a half from our last show. And Dogecoin up nearly five cents, about 4.7 cents from our last show. As we keep on rolling into your segment, it is time to answer your crypto questions. You've got questions about crypto. Who doesn't? It's time to find out the answers to your crypto questions. All right, everybody, let's do it. It's time to answer your crypto questions. This week's question comes from Alan. Alan wants to know, well, he says, first, loving the network. Well, thank you, Alan. We love all you folks. Take the time to write in and listen and question and comment and rate and review. And of course, Join us on the Pro and the Plus live streams. We love you all out there. He goes on to say, crypto is one of my faves. Saw this right up on Coindesk and thought it would be fun to talk about on the show. And he sent in this link to an article here from Coindesk profiling how one Ether options trader lost $3 million in a trade gone bad. And they profile here a put seller in ETH options that uh, took it on the chin especially as ETH drove down to those three-month lows of around $1,700. What's interesting about this is that the, uh, the expert that this, uh, this author spoke to over there at Coindesk is our own Greg, Greg Magadini there from Genesis Volatility. So good to see them getting some love out there as well. And talks about a 5,000 lot of the Dees, the Dees expiration. So they went out to Dees. They had some time on their hands. And unfortunately, if you're, if you're selling premium, we said it before, you probably don't want to go out too far <laughs> on these names for some reasons like this, but also the fact that you're not maximizing a lot of the premium harvesting, premium decay elements that you really want when you're selling premium. It sounds like this person went out to the uh, 2560 option in December in ETH and blasted out about 5,000 of those. And as you could tell from the action over the course of the past weeks, didn't really work out too well for them uh, because they had to come back and buy them back again it's kind of hard looking at the limitations of some of the eth options data available to see exactly what went up what prices they went up uh, so greg actually did a little bit of homework he looked at the average price for those puts between april and mid-may as right around 447 that's how he calculated the value for that. So he came up with a value of about two, almost two and a quarter million in premium that they harvested by selling those 5,000 contracts. Uh, unfortunately, last Tuesday, so during the height of that sell off, those same options were trading for nearly $1,100, $1,080. So he had a, he collected about two, almost two and a quarter million in premium. He had to spend nearly five and a half million to buy them back. So that's where that roughly $3 million loss comes in out there and you may be saying well what if they did a put spread or something like that doesn't look like they did the other strikes around it didn't really change by the same amount of oi that the 2560s did so it seemed like someone came in we talked about this type of trade many times on our option block program in the past my cohort there the rock lobster likes to call these line in the sand puts this fellow or lady we don't know drew a pretty sizable line in the sand at 2560 he did it all the way out to Deese to his misfortune. Didn't do it a little bit earlier, so they could have gone the way of the dodo. He would have been all right right now. And unfortunately, his line was crossed. It was crossed pretty aggressively. And at a certain point, you just can't take the pain anymore. You have to buy him back. Now, obviously, you could say, well, this guy had waited a little bit. It would have looked a lot better right now. And that is the case. But at a certain point, you know, the risk is too much. You have to have some safeguards in place. You can't let these continue to blow up in your face. What if ETH had dropped way back to, let's say, 1,000 again? This guy would be out. A lot more, maybe his fund or his firm or if he's an individual, whatever it would be, would be out of business. And also you could have 
your brokers and your risk managers tapping you on the shoulder saying, hey, you know, you need to close this out. You can't let this run. So it could have been an, an involuntary closure on his part as well, which can certainly be the case. So, yeah, we did see that. I'd like to see uh, Greg and the Genesis platform getting some love out there in Coindesk and others. And, yeah, that's sometimes the the dark side of doing this. If you're going to sell options, you have to have plans in place for when it goes against you. And unfortunately, it went against this trader out here. Great article. Great discussion here. Thanks for that. Alan. All right, everybody. That music means we've come to the end of another excellent journey through the world of all things crypto. Derivatives, I want to thank our guest, Rain Steinberg, the CEO and co-founder over there at Arca. You guys know where to find them. Give them a follow on the old Twitters. At Arca is the place to go for a lot of that data that we've talked about over here in the past. A lot of fascinating stuff. We've had their different representatives on the show in the past. I got a feeling we'll have them on again. It's interesting stuff to, uh, to check out. If you want to check them out for yourselves, uh, AR.ca is the place to go. And of course, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, and subscribing, and listening live. And of course, keep those questions and comments coming. If you have questions, remember, not so much about the crypto this time, but if you have questions, our next pro Q&A coming up tomorrow with one of the legends in short ball trading himself we can talk to him about what this fellow maybe should have done selling all these puts out here so uh, that'll be a fun one join us tomorrow a little bit earlier it's gonna be noon central 1 p.m eastern for all of our folks out there in the pro who have access to that and of course we're coming at you a little bit later in the day with the advisors option live as well and then of course wednesday we have the double dose of education options boot camp options playbook radio for all of you out there still learning about the world of options and hey we're all learning about options these days even those of us who've been doing it for a while so we're all still learning check out those shows a lot of you i know do so every week thursday double dose of twifo and the option block friday double dose of volatility views and the new pro content as well of options oddities and we're back again on monday another great episode of the crypto rundown this program is brought to you by genesis volatility also known as gvol home of institutional grade crypto options analytics whether you're trading cfi options or DeFi options cryptocurrencies move use gvol analytics to analyze implied volatility model realized volatility structure positions and unlock alpha for more information visit gvol.io that's g v o l dot i o You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.